Absolutely. But what blockchain allows, and being here in Africa, this is so strategic. This is why I love this. This is why I'm excited. <laughs> is that, you know, you have people all over Africa who might have a chance to be able to buy a part of, of that particular IP that they would never even dream of owning, yeah. or could do their own project with non-fungible tokens now and get investors from China, from Japan, from the Bahamas, from Jamaica, from yeah. anywhere. So this is this is what I think. A lot of what blockchain allows us this kind of borderless, frictionless uh, um, ecosystem where we have to be able to apply it properly, mm -hmm. of course, under the right regulations and so on, so that we can create more conducive environments for entrepreneurs to be able to grow, to create their own economies of scale, to have trickle down effects, to impact. impact. Hello and what's happening everyone, Gray Jabesi here and you're listening to the Gray Ant Podcast, Africa's number one podcast in blockchain technology and business. So today I have a very, very special guest and I have a very special podcast episode for you uh, coming out of the blockchain. So I was at the African Blockchain Conference, uh, it, it, it was a two-legged conference, which the first one was in Johannesburg. And the other one was in Cape Town and I happened to attend both of them so one of the people that I met there was Matt Arnett who is the CEO of Pure 8 and these guys are bringing marine archaeology to the blockchain all the way from the Bahamas and when I met Matt and he explained to me about his project you know immediately I was like wow this is one of the most different and unique projects that I've seen on the space because I mean let's face it um, we we in the blockchain space right now it's kind of crowded with a lot of the same so it's either someone is building an exchange or a stable coin or another blockchain and you know it's, it's a lot of the same so it was interesting to hear about a new um, you know a new and different project and it's really exciting uh, and it's coming out of, of the Bahamas and I think they're leading the way in the Bahamas when it comes to uh, What's going on in the STO market or the security tokens? So for a lot of people out there who have no idea or maybe you heard of security tokens or unfungible tokens But don't know a lot about them This is gonna be a great podcast for you because that's what Matt is doing and he's helping uh, a lot in the Bahamas to be a leading part uh, of this STO model. So I interviewed JP on the last po uh, episode uh, where we discussed about how Marta is leading when it comes to regulating blockchain. But then uh, the moment it, lo it looks like the Bahamas are leading when it comes to uh, specifically to the STO which is a, a new thing. So I think that is very very exciting and just to put it out there you, you guys have to know that uh, this episode is available on video as well so if you go on my, uh, on my website if you're listening to this on my website if you scroll down you'll be able to see the link or you can go on YouTube and just search great Jabez PO8 or great Jabez uh, Matt Arnett interview you should be able to find it uh, it was incredibly short I think you guys will be able to enjoy it so one thing that I also learned from this episode was that having someone uh, from a different industry is really a good thing when you're coming into the blockchain space because for a lot of people out there they feel like you have to be uh, a developer or some sort for you to get into the blockchain and start building things uh, i think matt stands out or his project stands out because he's coming from a completely different background as an entrepreneur he spent 15 years in china uh, he had a ticketing company in china that he sold uh, but then you know he ended up in the space and he's doing what he's doing now with pure eight so i think this is a very good point to a lot of people listening out there that would be like oh blockchain i'm not a developer how am i gonna get involved in all that uh, but anyway so let me just give you a little bit a bit more detailed uh summary about matt and then we get into the podcast itself so matthew is or matthew arnett is a bahamian explorer serial entrepreneur and co-founder of pure 8 the 2018 inter-american development bank recipient of the most innovative startup he is also the co-founder of Fort and FT Protocol, the Bahamas project, I mean, the Bahamas first project 
on the blockchain and cryptocurrency projects. Most recently, he has also co-developed the first reward based on chain, off-chain NFT digital collectible called Scarly. Matthew is a member of the Non-Fungible Alliance and Stablecoin Association. Prior to PO8 and Fort, Matthew was the co-founder of SendMeTickets.com, the first English language online ticketing platform in China acquired by a private equity group in 2012. So you get to hear the story that you know he was doing events in China, uh, getting artists like Kanye West and a lot of other guys. So I think if you, whatever you're doing in the space, whether you're an, you're an investor uh, or just an enthusiast in the blockchain, whatever you're doing, a developer, I would say that you should definitely check out PO8 and their website is PO8.io, I believe. Yeah, so I hope you guys check it out and uh, enjoy the podcast. Remember, it's also on video. Please subscribe to the Gray F podcast and to my YouTube channel as well, Gray Jabesi. And I will definitely appreciate it. And we're on iTunes and we're on where, where else? iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, wherever, wherever. Yeah, all the podcasting platforms. So I hope you'll be able to subscribe and uh, listen to this podcast quite easily so i hope you enjoy it here is my conversation with matt arnett so let's get uh into, reintroduce you okay. again all right so yeah. my name is matthew arnett i am from the bahamas and i am the ceo of poh and fort nft protocol yeah. we are pioneering what i would say is a new chapter in marine exploration yeah. um and I think something that's amazing is that all of this is made possible because of non-fungible tokens. Mm -hmm. um, last time you and I spoke, I was telling you about how uh, I'm constantly pushing, pushing the envelope, living in the future, because I think it's very key to build for that three to five year consumer and that three to five year world. Yeah. So what that means in, in, in essence is that we believe that non-fungible tokens are secure stores of value. And when you connect uh, a off-chain custodial layer and a security layer that could be instantly audited right, for those underlying assets, then people can have trust in that non-fungible token to have the intrinsic value of that underlying asset, then you can now take that non-fungible token and do anything you want with it, right? Yeah. You, you can you can sell them, you can leverage them, you can use them, you know, to auction, to trade, whatever you want. So, let's just break it down. Mm -hmm. What what an unfungible token is. Okay. So, if you could yes. tell a story that would give out exactly what it is. Well, I think one of the simplest ways of looking at at, at and, and I think this comes down a lot to as we go forward, mm -hmm. as as I would say, um, we're we're engineers of the blockchain highway or, or our blockchain map. Where are we going as a blockchain community? There are any number of contributors. I, I just want to mention this before we jump into that, just because it's on my mind. I think that the blockchain community has become very elitist. There are a lot of people who will keep certain people out of certain circles. So that centralization that we wanted to kind of do away with yeah. by having a decentralized apparatus or system that would be able to sort of govern or, or, or do whatever we wanted to. It would be a, 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 a stage for us to build on, right? Yeah. I, I kind of feel sometimes that we're also kind of recreating it now. You get a sense of it when you look at the way um, media comes into play when you look the way how access comes to play there's a lot of people that have these gates and these gatekeepers to make sure that you know oh only certain types yeah, of people becoming get a, a club yeah. it's becoming a club yeah. so I yeah. think that it's it's important that we as uh, creators always try to stay open while time is important mm -hmm. you still stay open because we're at a very infant stage of blockchain to continue to educate people Yes. Right? We can't become so elitist that, oh, I can't talk to this person. Mm -hmm. Oh, that person can't it's attend my industry. event. Yeah, 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 this thing and the next thing. And it's just like, wow, we are becoming the monsters that we tried to bring down. Yeah. So, back to the fungible, non fungible, the two sides of the cryptocurrency world, right? Mm -hmm. It's fungible. That means that it's like a Bitcoin and a Ethereum, EOS, any of those. Those two, they can be swapped. 
yeah. in between each other, right? So uh, they're all valued the same. If you have one, oh, it's like having a dollar. I have one dollar, you have one dollar, we can swap them right now. One rand, one rand, swap them right now. Mm-hmm. But non-fungible tokens, they cannot be swapped. Even if I had a non-fungible token that's worth one dollar and your non-fungible token was worth one dollar, the underlying asset is different. So then we would have to come to agreement that I want your underlying asset. So it's really more about the underlying asset. All right. But let's just say there's a non-fungible token that the underlying asset or, or, or the backing of that asset back token is gold. Mm-hmm. So we'll say that is uh, one ounce of gold. And then you, but that one ounce of gold now also has to have some unique characteristics, meaning that that one ounce of gold, or let's say one bar of gold rather, would have uh, its stamp on it, which would be a, a unique identification number. Yeah. Maybe it has some other markings on it. We know who the manufacturer is. That's that's how deep you can go with non-fungible tokens. Right. So when you start to think all of the data you could put in the metadata of a token, then you understand how you could build in so many layers of trust into that token. Now you had that 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 gold back non fungible token, and now you have a uh, a platinum back non fungible token. Yeah. Those two cannot be switched because they are completely different. different. Yeah. But if we had a marketplace, and I said to you over the marketplace, pair to pair still, so there's still decentralized and centralized components, right? Because having that marketplace is not going to be decentralized. Anybody just put anything, no. Mm-hmm. Because we have to verify now. And that's why that's why the protocol is so important. We have to verify the authenticity of those underlying assets. So that's why you have to work in concert with decentralization and centralization, so that you can deliver a more secure product to 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 the market, right? Um, and so you have these two tokens, and then we can we can switch if we want. Yeah. Right. It's up to us. But but we understand that the value that value is just completely different. So is this in a way that um, you can have access or you can have ownership, you can have a piece of some, something or own the entire thing by not actually having the physical object. Exactly, right. but I like the way that you just kind of cultivated that idea uh-huh. because then that just shows you that anybody can take a non-fungible token, mm-hmm. right? And they just need to see how can I apply this non-fungible token to my business model, so yes, Let's say we talk about real estate. Mm-hmm. We talked about this building. You said we're gonna we wanna buy this building. We're gonna have a thousand owners. We're gonna fractionalize it. Everybody can put in how much they wanted, but we need to hit twenty million dollars. Now, we already built out the model, we're gonna be making um ten percent annually based on rentals and all this stuff. But now you put in a million, I put in five hundred thousand, he put in two two million. We all have different types of non fungible tokens. Yeah. Right? And so my non-fungible token in my wallet, I put in a million, it's worth a million. I know that I own X percentage of the building, and then it can be calculated automatically. My my supposed income or my potential earnings after a per quarter, a year, and yeah. then we can pay out to the wallets of those non-fungible tokens, stable stable tokens, mm-hmm. right? On, on, in terms of dividends, or maybe I said, well, I don't want stable. I want I want um, um, USD or I want fiat, whatever. I have you could also do that, but. Just trying to stay in the line of getting away from yeah. those things. Yeah. You know, untethering ourselves, <laughs> we can pay with tether. Yeah. So um, I think that's brilliant. And then you can just apply that same sort of formula to a lot of different types of business, like IPs. Mm-hmm. You know, like imagine we had a, a, a an IP, and I and I, you know what? If you look at fashion, look at Fila. Mm-hmm. Fila, back when you and I were young. Um, not that we aren't young now, but I would say maybe when we were about 15 years old or so, mm-hmm. maybe I'm a little bit older than you, but um, Fila was hot. Like, you know, Fila was in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Fila died for a minute. Then yeah, it was bought by another company, and now it's been redistributed. Exactly. It's got a social media presence. You see all the millennials. The, They're the, loving yeah, it. Yeah, the 90s. And I'm just like, yeah, I can't. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have thrown that Fila shoes, those Fila jackets and shoes and stuff away, but yeah. I threw them away. I gave them away to, I think I donated them to the like, Salvation Army or whatever. But the point is that if, if we saw that opportunity, we could have said, let's buy the Fila um, IP. Mm-hmm. Then we were going to make a global raise for that. Everybody from who loved Fuel in the past would now be the owners through exactly. non-fungible tokens. Yeah. And now when we go and lease that out to a clothing company, right, to market it, to make new clothing, to distribute it. Absolutely. You know? But that's exactly what um, Marvel does. 
Yes. The, what that's what they did with the with the with the movies yes. and the comic books. Yes. Yes. Right. But that's again we go back to access. Mm -hmm. Marvel would never give guys like you and me access. Absolutely. But what blockchain allows and being here in Africa, this is so strategic. This is why I love this. This is why I'm excited. <laughs> is that, you know. You have people all over Africa who might have a chance to be able to buy a part of, of that particular IP that they would never even dream of owning yeah. or could do their own project with non-fungible tokens now and get investors from China, from Japan, from the Bahamas, from Jamaica, from yeah. anywhere. So this is, this is what I think a lot of what blockchain allows us. This is kind of borderless, frictionless uh, um, ecosystem where we have to be able to apply it properly Mm -hmm. Of course, under the right regulations and so on, so that we can create more conducive environments for entrepreneurs to be able to grow, to create their own economies of scale, to have trickle down effects, to impact, 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 impact. Yeah, and grow. yeah, yeah. Because imagine, imagine being how many people in Africa or in Asia or in India who could afford to buy into Facebook. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's like things like those. Yeah, the exactly. access is just, we know that there's a gold market exists, but mm -hmm. all those things are in a closed market. Mm -hmm. Only a few knows how That's to right. even get it. Only if you have connections, if you have friends, if you have something like this, then you're really able to say, oh, I'm going to gain access to this. But I think... Or if you're in the right, right location exactly. to begin with, because these things are not global. Exactly. But I think, especially if you look at the, the integration of the internet, with what that gave us, and you also look at non-fungible tokens, you look at blockchain, you look at all of these parts coming together, then you say to yourself, okay, wow, um, here is a great opportunity for me to gain access, whether it's to the gold market, whether it is, and, and I think here in Africa, if you look at some low-hanging fruits, you look at, especially South Africa, you look at uh, mining, mm -hmm. what's been going on here for years, but yeah. that, that industry is completely closed. Absolutely, right? absolutely closed. But you do have a few projects uh, that I see popping up where people want to kind of, um, re-energize maybe a gold mine and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Now you can have people that have new interests coming in from a global uh, variety or you could look at even uh, I went down to um, just just in the in Joburg. Yes. In Joburg there are a lot of buildings in a certain part that were nice skyscrapers but they've kind of been left. Oh in the central in the part central of Joburg. Part, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had, a, I, have, I had an idea and I was saying man you know why don't we just uh, take a couple of these buildings, right? And fractionalize them. They'll Absolutely. be the first non-fungible token buildings in South Africa. We get all the in, many investors from around the world, and then we put, you know, whether they're spaces for blockchain, for creatives, whatever it is. But the point is that you can bring those 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 properties back to life and bring the value back to them mm -hmm. and then it could be something that we would never have access to because you know that real estate market is so, controlled by certain you know this is going to shock you so 64 billion rands mm. was raised last year through a formula called uh stock mm. in south africa where it kind of a community thing maybe you have, it's an old concept mm -hmm. a circle of people mm -hmm. put money together and give each other money every month or like a suit yeah all bahamas they call it a a exactly yeah, almost yeah. like that so 64 billion was raised because we hear people that do it in, at a large scale but the majority of that money was spent on groceries on shop like shop right and pig and pay in which with that amount of money they could have been able to buy, to buy one of those major, major uh, mega stores here, right? But those people, they try to do those things. Uh, they like the idea of investment. They just don't know how to. Exactly. You know? And they probably also just don't have, um, they don't have access to the right platforms. That that's exactly what product, it is. Because right? if you had the concept of uh, uh, non-fungible tokens mm -hmm. with the Johannesburg buildings, uh -huh. well, they would have been the people to buy in. They would. You know, we have 64 billion. Let's do it. They, they would. They would. Yeah. They would. So I think you know, and then bring bring us just back to why I'm here in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Now we're in Cape Town, yeah. which is which is beautiful, by the way. Cape Town is beautiful, but mm -hmm. but Africa was definitely one of the key places. But South Africa was the first place for me. So there's a lot of history between the Bahamas and South Africa. In 1985. Um, the, the then Prime Minister of the Bahamas. So there was something called the Nassau Accord. So you know that, you know, South Africa, the Bahamas, Canada, New Zealand, uh, India were all Commonwealth countries yes. after the British. Yeah. So back in 1985, the US and the United Kingdom did not agree with putting sanctions against South Africa to, okay. to end apartheid and free Nelson Mandela. So, 
the president of the Bahamas, when we hosted, or the prime minister of the Bahamas, Sir Lyndon Oscar Pinnon, when we hosted what they called Chogum, and mm -hmm. Chogum was basically the, the governmental meeting of all Commonwealth countries, we hosted in the Bahamas. And he was a chairperson, so he, was, he, had, he had a lot of access to speak, so he spoke about that issue, mm -hmm. and he nailed it home very eloquently. He said, we have to band together as Commonwealth countries against South Africa. We must enforce these sanctions to end apartheid, yeah. right, and to free Nelson Mandela. Well, in 1985, he got everybody to agree. Still, you, still the United Kingdom is on the outside. But everybody else agreed. So they signed that and they pushed these sanctions against South Africa. Yeah. In 1986, he made his first trip here. By 1994, 1990, uh, 1991, Nelson Mandela was free. free yeah. His first trip overseas, he went to the Bahamas. Okay. Oh, that? I didn't know Did that. Could you imagine that? <laughs> the first trip of Nelson Mandela from South Africa was yeah. to the Bahamas. To thank, oh, right. to thank my prime minister yeah. for leading the charge to help to help push push the pressure more pressure against the apartheid movement and help free Nelson Mandela. So there's so so there's so much history between the two countries. I just felt like look, I want to start there. I want to be here in South Africa. I want to be able to 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 give another branch of, of education and blockchain mm -hmm. to what we're to 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 South Africans and then Africans in general. So my heart is here. You yeah. know, I think that there've been men great men that have gone before you and I, but they've built this stage. So we're basically right now be able to stand on the shoulder of those giants. Right. You understand right. what I'm saying? So that's why what you and I are doing here today is so important for the other young people for yes. them to say one day they're gonna say, man, Gray and Matt, they were there. Yeah, now yeah. that's why I can do this. So this is why we have to continue. But you know, it, what you're saying is really true because sometimes we, in our community, especially, we lose connection of how things are connected yep. to come to this point. Yep. You know, yep. it's like the last generation was a little worse. Yes. And then, you know, it yep. gets better and better. But then that connection also gets looser and looser Correct. for some reason. Correct. And you know why? Because exactly what we're doing today, mm -hmm. we don't do very well in our communities. We don't tell the stories of our own heroes. Absolutely. So people are talking about the Mark Zuckerbergs and the Elon Musk and all mm -hmm. this stuff, but we can't necessarily identify with them. Absolutely, right? right. Especially not here on the continent. Mm. I don't know anybody who's, who's really identifying. There might be some kids, but at the end of the day, there has to be people that look like us. There has to be people who are on a mission to make our lives personally better that these kids can look up to and say, wow, I want to be... Um, you know, in the in the, the new social media broadcasting, I want to be a podcaster. I mm -hmm. want to be in the tech world. I want to be a developer. I want to be a an, an engineer of some sort. I want to be an artificial intelligence and robotics, right? I don't have yeah. to be in athletics. Not that athletics is bad. It's, I mean, it's great. It's, sa yeah. it's saved a lot of people. It's created amazing stories. But we have more to offer. Absolutely. And I think that's yeah. why we have to continue to push that out there. And I think, especially with what the Bahamas is now doing having our financial background mm -hmm. uh, you know the Bahamas has always been in the financial world over 200 years we have you know hundreds of banks in the Bahamas we've always been delivering great financial services that's our second you know, biggest uh, um, effect on the economy first is tourism financial mm -hmm. services and, and, and then our agriculture and fisheries but what the Bahamas is doing right now that ties into the parallel of blockchain is the STO movement. Yes. We are putting the laws into place, not just a framework, but actual laws and act, a bill that says, hey, you can come to the Bahamas, whether you are doing custodial services, you're keeping people's cryptos and you need to be registered properly, or whether you have a token offering, mm. it could be a utility token, a non-fungible token, it could be an, an, a security token, all of those can be now registered in the Bahamas. And of course, if you want to do um, other blockchain related activities, we're providing you the stage and the platform to do those things legally yeah. under a very... Uh, the, the, the law is, is very welcoming um, and it allows people to feel safe and secure. It protects the investors, but it gives all of these creators the ability to now not worry about the legal side so yes. much. Because, you know, it, 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 it has been unclear for a very long time. Yes. Yeah. And yes. that is that turns a lot of people off, especially investors. It does. Yeah. So what what did it take for you? I mean, I, sh I think the right question is, 
at what point did the, the Bahamas mm -hmm. became very active with this? Because a lot of governments, they're still, you know, they're not doing anything about it. That's mm -hmm. why the regulation is still unclear mm -hmm. about what, what's going to happen. Well, I think it, the, the year was 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a new government come into place. Right. Um, and they said, look, we want to get the Bahamas moving towards tech. Uh, right. I remember. So it, it was actually a conscious decision. Conscious decision, very right. conscious decision. Um, and so I took it upon myself to say, look, I'm going to take this mantle mm. and I'm going to start pushing forward. And by pushing forward, I meant, look, I'm going to be creating businesses and startups that not only create social and economic impact, but it puts a demand on the government to kind of hold their foot to the fire. So mm -hmm. if I'm producing, then I need you to produce a certain set of things for me to yeah. create, which will then only blaze a trail for other people to come and create. And of course, they've been great people that have been in the circle as well from the Bahamas Securities Exchange Commission, our commissioners named Christina Rowe. Mm. So she's been very active in putting this, 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 the laws and acts together now, the regulations. So you'll see um, in March, mm -hmm. those will probably be enacted and, and we'll start promoting and people can come to the Bahamas and they'll be able to actually, just like I said, use this as a stage. And, and I think some of the smart things that we've done as a community in the Bahamas is we've said, look, you can trust us. You've always trusted us. Yes. You, you trust us with your money. You trust us with the banks. Now we're just going to provide our service that we be provided to other people, but to the blockchain community now. Mm -hmm. So it's it's something that's a very, what I would say, a very natural progression. All right. It's easy. Right. It's easy for people to say, yes, I can trust that brand. From, from someone in Africa who would want to take this whole thing. And I mean, here we have a lot of broken systems, mm -hmm. right? in which they could be solved uh, using blockchain mm -hmm. at a lower price than what the government actually spend mm -hmm. to manage some of their systems, mm -hmm. to implement some of their uh, uh, information. Yeah. So how does one get to speak to government? Wow. Because one, one of the biases that are in the tech community, I mean, it's kind of a valid bias mm -hmm. from my perspective. They don't like to work with politicians mm -hmm. because of how different these two industries are. Mm -hmm. You know, tech is kind of more open if you have good ideas win mm -hmm. or good products win. Mm -hmm. Politics is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think in order for us as a blockchain community mm -hmm. to really drive forward uh, just an advancement and a maturity, there has to be a level of discipline, mm -hmm. right? And within that level of discipline, we have to, while there can be the spectrum of the, you know, crypto punk, the anarchist, and then, you know, the government employee who's mm -hmm. creating a, a project for the government, we have to have a middle ground. We have to have unity. Yes. I think that's one of the key things that we see uh, is a problem in many communities around the world, but especially in Africa, is the lack of unity. Yes. So there has to be a coming together, but globally, Globally, and even in the Caribbean and the Bahamas, has been a problem where you have leaders who, I don't know, they get elected and all of a sudden they know everything, right? Mm -hmm. I, I call it the back of the car effect, right? They get a driver, they're sitting in the back of the car, and the air all of a sudden is different, mm -hmm. right? They, they turn into a superhero and they don't want to staff their weaknesses, yes. right? They don't know the first thing about tech globally, and so they won't invite practitioners they won't invite stakeholders to the table and they won't say hey guys what do you need you know let me let's set up a self-regulating body let's give you the exactly. framework yeah, ah, yeah. So I think that's the key for Africa yeah, right yeah, yeah. And, and we just talk I mean you when you say Africa man that's a big that's a, that's a whole continent so it's hard to say what each individual country needs but there are some frameworks that I think would work generally and that is giving a set of creators those 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 regular that regulatory framework to just say okay guys you guys have what you need as a as a foundation you guys have to go out there and create now we holding your foot to the fire yeah you know we need so many jobs you need to solve this problem then you don't have any excuses right because you can't say well the government didn't give me an opportunity to yeah. the next right but the government has to take their hands off of some areas and say look we're not the strongest in tech, but there are all these young South Africans out there that can actually come in. And then when the South Africans might say, oh man, we need a better um, solidity you know, uh, developer. We need, we, need, we need a stronger um, securities framework. 
then that's when you start to liaison with your partners around the world to bring in a guy from um, Croatia, you know, yeah. to bring in a guy from so, from, from Kenya. From Kenya, Kenya has a lot of us. Yeah, from Kenya. From, yeah, you don't even have to go to Croatia, yeah. right? You go to Kenya, you go to Nigeria, wherever. Yeah. And you say, okay, guys, this is what we're doing. And I think that's one of the good roles of the of the Blockchain Association of Africa, right? Mm -hmm. Is bringing together all of the, this pool of talent and then we now know it's in this pool of talent and we can say, man, we, we need this type of guy. We, we can put a tender out there in the pool mm -hmm. of talent and then people start to say, okay, yeah, I'm here, I can do this. And again, you know, you don't have to travel that much, right? You do all things sitting, sitting in, 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 your, in your boxes and in, yeah. in your house in Kenya, right? You can get that done. But if we don't bring unity, right? Mm -hmm. We're not going to make any progress. That is very right? true. So yeah. even the idea of interoperability in the blockchain community has to play over even stronger mm -hmm. in the African community because there has to be an interoperability. There has to be this agnostic sort of, we have to come together, the tech community. Because, you know, one of the things that, uh, what, that is a little frustrating, that with all this technology that we have, mm -hmm. right, uh, African growth depends on its, um, its economics. Yeah. And you find that, you know, right now it's much harder for you to move money from two, uh, between two African countries than it is to move to the UK. Of course. You of know? course. Uh, and we have all the technology to do it. People who can build it, I, I think it's just about the will and the unity, like you say. Like, you know, if the two countries can get to terms mm -hmm. with each other or if the, the, the political side of things, they're not really driven. But you, you also have to look at it from another perspective. At mm. the end of the day, this is money. Yeah. This is business. Yes. Right? You're dealing with men. Men at their very core what? Selfish. Yeah. So you're dealing with some centralized powers out there. You, you're dealing with, you know, quote unquote, the man, right? You're yeah, dealing yeah. with those people who, who own the banks, who own the remittance services. They don't want to let go of their piece of the pie. So that's why when you hear, you hear the terms about being disruptive and all that, mm. is where you have, you know, entrepreneurs out there who who want to be daring and who want to let their faith meet their feet and hands and they go forward and they say we're going to create this product and we're going to start to market it and we're going to start to allow people to transfer this money mm -hmm. right with cryptocurrencies but being able to also see because you have to look at the full what you know in, in china uh, we, it's called e tao long fu mm -hmm. e tao long fu just means from that a to z solution yeah okay. right so yeah, we can transfer the cryptocurrency from South Africa to Nigeria. But I also need, when I'm in Nigeria, to get my cash. Mm. So then you also need, whether it's a standalone place that's going to do the transaction from the cryptocurrency to cash, or ATM machines that's going to do from cryptocurrency to cash, because at the end of the day, we can't act like we're living in you know 2030, yeah. right? This is still a cash society for mm -hmm. the most part. Now. There are cards that are being integrated, like Visa backed cards, Master card backed cards that have cryptocurrency, and you can use those. But you know, again, Master card, Visa, you're yeah. still playing into in, the beast. In the right? game, you're yeah. still feeding that beast. So you can do things that don't require a lot of capital. Um, and I think there are a lot of other solutions out there. For example, there's a great solution where it's basically like Uber, right? But you have these people who are willing to cash out through their app, right? Um, cryptocurrency for cash so let's say you have cryptocurrency you could look on your app you could say okay how many guys around me are are cashing out and you go to their building you go they come to you you send them it they give you the cash you go now yeah. again a safety issue comes into play mm -hmm. but at the end of the day you could see how that sort of kind of gig economy comes into play uh, blockchain comes into play you know the, the sort of internet of things all comes into play and those are the solutions that would really help so I'm also curious to learn more about your, your adventures in, in mm. China. Oh, wow. When yeah. did you just decided to move there? I was in high school at the time. Okay. Um, so that was back in like 2003, 2004. And um, the Chinese government asked the Bahamas, they said, hey, we want you to send three young people mm. to China. So it was a Caribbean Latin American conference on, you know, on China. You can see China and, and, and a lot of people a lot of people have to study China sometimes mm. just enable to build up your global business acumen and so on and to learn certain lessons. So China back then, that's almost what, 15 years ago now, mm -hmm. they said we're going to plant seeds. 
Okay. See, people didn't see that. People just thought, oh, they want they want some young people to come. We don't know why, <laughs> right? And that happens so much. I, yeah. I, I always find it funny how even successive governments in the Caribbean and the Bahamas, and I think also here, Africa might be a little bit different, and I'm not very familiar with, with how the Africans negotiate with China because the, the African governments get a lot out of China. I mean, they really get a lot. You think so? What? There's a, there's a, there's a, a narrative here mm -hmm. right now that China is now overtaking Africa. Because of the bank loans that they're doing, they have um, massive uh, loans that mm -hmm. they give into Africa mm -hmm. that they're more likely to not be able to pay back. So mm -hmm. Kenya mm -hmm. has a lot of uh, Chinese money, mm -hmm. a lot of Africa actually. So if you travel within Africa now, mm -hmm. you actually be seeing a lot of Chinese people than Europeans at this mm -hmm. point. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, I, I've seen that, mm -hmm. and I remember when I when I well well in China, I remember when it was. Um, it was a period when they invited all of the African uh, governments, not all, but a lot of the African governments, the government, the presidents to yeah. China. And they wrote off a lot of their debt and they gave them new loans. And then just recently, there was a time of that again. And I think it was about 60 billion that was earmarked for Africa. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you're right. A lot of those loans will not be able to be paid back. But that is the same scenario of the young student planting the seed and the now government official having the billions of dollars given to them. Mm -hmm. Now, the real question that the people of Africa should ask is, what happened to those billions of dollars? How many, how, how much? And if we did use blockchain and we were able to trace every mm -hmm. dollar, did it get to the hands of the people, to the projects, right? How much was siphoned off? You would be shocked. At, yeah. the, at the number, Absolutely, at yeah. the corruption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so they don't consider the people. They don't consider you or your children. Right. They consider themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So if they don't pay it back, that ain't on them. Exactly, because they're yeah. going to be in France, in their house, and they'll be in, in New York, in their, 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 their Manhattan yeah, apartment. Exactly. You understand? So that is the problem that I've been saying, that Africa lacks the aspect of um, uh, accountability. Yeah. I think it's just that is has something to do with how the systems are but set not up. Not just Africa. Oh yeah, globally. Globally, yeah. I think the system allows you to come in as a mm -hmm. politician mm -hmm. with no skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So, if you win, you win more to yourself. Mm -hmm. If you lose, you don't really get anything out of it. You know, you don't feel the pain. Correct. The people bears the, the entire risk. Even throughout the Caribbean, there have been successive governments who've who've gotten into office and they haven't delivered on promises, there's mm. been charges of corruption. Um, and so then you would see where, you know, European countries start to speak about putting sanctions here and there and blacklisting people yeah. because they feel it's too much corruption. Um, and Latin American countries, same thing. Successive governments change, let's lock up this guy, mm. let's take him to, to the courts. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, when the cameras are off, a lot of those guys are still buddy buddies. Oh, yeah, you know, of course. Right? Yeah. They still say, hey, you know, don't, don't do me so bad, you know? <laughs> you know your son. You yeah. See, you know? So, you know, I, I think it did, then it just shows you that there has to be a, a better level of artificial intelligence integrations where we trust the numbers more than the people, right? Absolutely. They have to, you, you should be able to see, you know, this money was that's allocated it. to build a hospital. Mm -hmm. Where is it? Mm -hmm. It's here. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what it's supposed to be. And, done. and then also, if you just look at, for example, a, a fund, because there are a lot of funds, and I, and I find this to be a problem here, mm -hmm. social impact investment in Africa. Mm -hmm. You've got all of these NGOs, NGOs, this NGOing, as I call it, has become yeah. a business. Oh, it is. For profit. The high school that I went uh -huh. was registered as an NGO to some British companies mm -hmm. that they were sending food and mm -hmm, stuff mm -hmm. to the school mm -hmm, owner mm -hmm. and then you know he was running a bit it's, it's one of the most expensive schools in the country at wow. the time wow yeah so i don't understand how they how they kind of add all of these stuff up but i but but what i've seen happen is you can't trace the money mm -hmm. and the money that is supposed to be earmarked for projects maybe 20 percent goes to the project the other 80 yeah. percent Vanishes. Logistics is like, oh, it's there. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah, it vanishes. I wouldn't even say logistics. It vanishes. Right? right. And if you look at the way, even the, even the Red Cross, they've been taken under fire about how executives are traveling and so on and so forth and these expensive dinners and so on. Look, if people would really be open to transparency, and this is going to bring us back to the blockchain community, I think that applying those technologies like blockchain in the right way, 
you know, triple en- triple entry accounting mm-hmm. you know, with a distributed ledger, you would see how people would say, man, I can't even steal this money. Yeah. How do I do this? And they would have to work other deals. But if we're saying all this stuff about transparency as an industry, I want to go right back to the STO movement that's, that's just starting mm-hmm. and the ICO movement that has kind of, I guess, passed. It, it's met its demise. All of these companies now are not releasing their financials, mm-hmm. right? As PO8, uh, since we are embarking on our STO, we've decided we're releasing our finances. Yeah. We're going to be transparent. We're going to actually act out the gold standard of what a, a, a strategic, uh, a securitized token offering is supposed to be. Because then that shows the market that, look, when you want to look for a great project, you need to make sure they have uh, their financials. You need to make sure that their financials have been looked over by an accountant. Mm-hmm. You need to make sure that they've been approved by their local Securities Exchange Commission. You need to make sure of this, that, the next. So we, we've got like a list of about 10 to 15 key checklist components mm-hmm. that the PO8 STO meets and then sets the standard for the industry, which also safeguards investors, right? So investors, when they look at how do I invest, they can say, well, oh, I remember I did invest in PO8 and this, they had all these things. Now there's this other STO, but they're nowhere close to this. I'm not sure. So one thing that I've seen with the regulation in the crypto space is that at the beginning it was everyone is free for all. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Which was great and bad. Mm-hmm. Um, but now with the limitations that are being brought, now they're also even putting regulations on the investors. Mm -hmm. Because from my perspective, I would understand if you have to squeeze the companies themselves, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that you make sure that the the, the project that comes out Mm -hmm. is a legitimate project that it's okay for an investor to kind of put money onto it. But now it's becoming more pressure on the investor, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, kind of sanctions to some jurisdictions that, okay, Mm -hmm. Americans, you know, not involved. Mm -hmm. What's starting to happen now is that when the real companies are now raising funds, mm-hmm. have to, to, to set certain parameters mm-hmm. or minimum amounts of money, that, mm-hmm. like say $10,000 mm-hmm. minimum mm-hmm. for a private sale. Yes. That already eliminates all the people at the bottom. It does. You know, it does. I, I have a, a problem with that. It does. Uh, you know, I'll say this. I'll say that a lot of projects now are becoming more savvy. Mm. Um, they are seeking more legal advice. Um, especially if you are a project that is engaging in a security token offering, then you have a legal entity somewhere that is a must, which means that you must abide by the law of that local jurisdiction, which means then that you can be um, charged. Charges can be brought against you in that local jurisdiction. So they're acting in a lot of caution. So by eliminating that sort of everyday investment, then you also eliminate some of the threats that can come to you. So a lot of the local jurisdictions will say, okay, you should have only professional investors or accredited investors. Mm. They have to have so much net worth. And then, basically, the like, let's if we look at the United States of America, the SEC will say, well, if it's an accredited investor, then they, they should understand to how yeah. to invest. And then that same investor also is probably not going to be the person that's going to sue you uh, for some something that they think was was done maybe on toward or they didn't get the payout that they thought they received. Yeah. You know, and their communication would be a little bit better. It would be easier to deal with for the most part. Mm. So I think that that is why some people are being left out. Um, I hope though that that does not happen because during the ICO, the, the boom that it had, there were a lot of opportunities for people to invest, um, doing crowd sales and so on. But even sometimes then, if you weren't first out of the gate, you couldn't even get in mm. with the crowd sale. A lot of people said, look, it, it was basically, you know, bag holders, it was money changing hands, you, was, you were getting out the private sale guys, then you were left holding the bag, then it hit the exchange. And, yeah. and so people said, look, that's a broken system. It's not a system that can work for a long time. It's not a system that will be able to, uh, you know, just grow. So what we care about more is, is about long-term growth. For that long-term growth, you have to be aligned with, the, with some sort of regulation. Since we obviously couldn't have any self-regulation as an industry, mm-hmm. right? That wasn't working very well. Now we've had to move to a, a stage where, but I mean, maybe this coming together of jurisdictions with, with their local securities laws and projects raising money will give governments more exposure to what these companies are doing as blockchain projects or blockchain-related projects. And then it allows them to have a better understanding, which leads to better 
maybe even some looser regulations to certain things, to certain technologies, which just helps to springboard the whole industry forward. So maybe this, I think in the end, it's going to be a great thing. And I think that's one of the areas that we need for growth. And lastly, um, for a lot of peop young people in Africa mm -hmm. who are trying to be entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. possibly want to get involved in this space, yeah. what would you advise them? Well, I think um, one of the first things that they have to do mm -hmm. is they have to understand a lot about who they are as a person. Mm -hmm. They have to define who they are as a person because you would often hear, you know, VCs and, 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 and other angel investors say, I'm, I'm investing in teams. Yeah. I'm not necessarily investing in ideas. And they spend time with you. They get to know you. They want to know that you have integrity, right? Yes. That, that's, that's a key factor. They want to know that you have, have the tenacity. They want to know that you, you have this sort of, this ability to, to, to focus in on something and hit that target, mm -hmm. to be relentless. Um, so after knowing yourself, I think that they also have to realize that it's going to take a lot of faith, especially being here in Africa. Yes. You're going to have to say, look, you know, it doesn't look like anything is there, but I believe that it's there, mm -hmm. right? It also is, you're going to have the feeling like, I don't even see the end. I don't yeah, even yeah. know how, I'm, I can't see. Maybe I could understand from step one to 10, but boy, in the middle, I don't understand. Right, yeah, yeah. But that's where your faith and your feet have to meet and you have to go forward, right? I, I always tell a lot of people, persistence will get you there, right? Mm -hmm. Consistency will keep you there. So you have to be consistent. You have to build a good team. You have to surround yourself with maybe even a good mentor that's been out there before you. You also have to just do the right thing, mm -hmm. right? You, you can't allow yourself to get kind of torn away just to chase after money or to chase after something mm. like that. If you are out there with a passion to do the right thing, to help your community, to have social impact, economic impact, it's gonna work. And even if it's not the first idea and you have to pivot, it's the second or mm -hmm. the third idea. And everything that you build up along the way is what helps you have that winning combination, right? You, you look at, you look at all, a lot of the success stories out there. No one just hit it day one. Absolutely. No, man, yeah. you, you, you gotta dig deep, yeah. right? You gotta dig deep. You see that people have spent, you know, hundreds of hours off stage for that one hour performance on stage. Yeah. That's that, what it that, is. Exactly. So you gotta put in the time. Yeah. If you put in the time, you make it. Man, I think we have to end it here. But I mean one thing, how did you navigate through China? How do you I mean you got there did the <sighs> How do you navigate through China? That's yeah. a that's a great one. I'm actually working on a book okay. right now. Um uh and it's called Shur Shurnin Alawai. Okay. Right? Basically, it means, it means 10 years of a foreigner, but they use Lao Wai mm -hmm. as saying it's a term of endearment. But, okay. um, you know, I, <laughs> I'm not sure, right? <laughs> it depends on who says it. Right. But it basically speaks about my challenges. Mm -hmm. It speaks about, um, about the changes in China. It speaks about how I made it through China. Um, and, and I would say this, my faith in God was definitely one of the key ways that I made it through okay. China. Right. right, because it is you, you, you. I mean, 2006 when I got that, I didn't speak a word of Chinese. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know Ni Hao. I didn't do like some Rosetta Stone courses. Yeah, yeah. Nah, nah. I just, I, yeah, yeah. I just jumped no in. Duolingo do, no, uh, not during those times. Yeah. Nothing. I just jumped in. I remember month three. I looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, "What are you doing here? This yes. is never gonna work. Are you never gonna speak this yeah. language?" But I didn't give up. Right, I didn't give up. Of course, you know, I gotta pray in mother and father, mm. <laughs> put the blood of God on yeah. me. Right, yeah. didn't give up. But I, I finally start to find my way, get in little things. And what I would do was, um, and I got good advice from from guys that were there before me. Right, so so it's another guiding thing. You have to get advice from people who went before you. Yeah. So one of the guys, who, who's a who's a brilliant doctor in the Bahamas now, speaks Chinese fluently. He said, "Get a Chinese girlfriend." I mm -hmm. told him. I said, no way, I'm not going to do it. Now, about uh, two years ago, we were in the Bahamas. We had a Chinese um, investor down there that injured himself. We took him to the hospital. Mm. So he's used to me speaking Chinese. We went to the hospital, and this doctor is there, and he started speaking Chinese. Yeah. And they said, hey, 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 Matt, this guy's pronunciation is better than yours. How come? And he told them, but you do it, right? You, you get through it, you work through it, you work your contacts, you work, you know, you work, you just work. Yeah. You, work, you put in the work. It's all about relationships as well. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a term that's called mianzi, right? And I used mianzi as a social currency, yeah. right? I used it sometimes with and against certain Chinese to yeah. get certain things. But at the end of the day, it's always about sometimes 
maybe loyalties and, and being smart, mm. but you know, studying the best, trying to get in the best universities and producing. Right? So you, when you were there, I mean, it's one thing to be, mostly foreigners are known to be, you know, to have a lot of tenacity and mm -hmm. to be more driven. Mm -hmm. That's one thing when you're in a country that speaks the same language as mm -hmm. you and you have more people that look like you. Mm -hmm. In China, I mean, I, I suppose it would be easier for one to mm -hmm. actually just get a job mm -hmm. and, you know, just live there. Mm -hmm. But for an entrepreneur like yourself mm -hmm. in a foreign land, obviously you learn the language over time. Mm -hmm. How was that transition from yeah, your education to the business side of things now? Well, do you think being different there played into your advantage or it was a disadvantage? Well, my, my first company was a uh, guerrilla marketing and strategic kind of branding company. Mm. Our focus was live events. Back then, that played to my advantage, looking different. Uh, I, I went in instantly being an expert at mm. what I was doing. Right. right? Now, that, that was then. Mm. Now, it's completely different. The right. playing field is completely different. And that's one of the reasons why after getting a few offers for my company in 2013, I let it go. Mm -hmm. Because I understood that I was at a critical point where right. it either would be a decline or I would have to like double, triple down. But the price that was being offered was mm -hmm. beautiful. It was my baby, but you have to let go sometimes. You have yes. to know when to leave the party. That's another key. You mm -hmm. have to know when to leave the party. Yeah. So um, we went in there. I, I saw there was a problem. There was a lot of great events only marketed in Chinese, not in English. Mm. I went to a couple of the guys and I said, look guys, I know you're here for the Chinese market, but naturally you have to think about who knows that particular um, Chinese artist. Mm. Uh, not Chinese artist, foreign artist. It's going to be the foreigners. Yes. So let me market to the foreigners. I'm going to go and do And we started off as a street team, right? Mm -hmm. So we do flyers all around. We host in small events that are themed to this particular artist. And our first major hit was Kanye West, right? Imagine, yeah. I'm, I'm, at the time I was 22, I'm doing a Kanye West concert. Yeah. I'm hanging out with Kanye West and it's crazy. All of the guys, and I think about this now, two of the guys, Don C and the, the designer of Off-White, mm -hmm. his name is, uh, I forgot what his name is, but he's, he was Kanye West designer at the time. They're all gone big. Now, all those years later into their own fields, which means yes. that at the end of the day, whatever Kanye was had cooking with them, that creative helped them to now go out to be themselves themselves in their own field, not singing, yes. not rapping, yeah. designing, Don C is designing. That is a very uh, good point. Uh, Off-White is a hot brand. You know, yeah. Off-White is yes. a hot brand. All the millennials on the internet, you see all the girls in Off-White, guys yeah. in Off-White shoes. He's, he's collaborating. I think he just became the creative director of... Um, I forgot one mm. of the major major brands. So that just goes to tell you that you also have to. Uh, here's another key: you gotta surround yourself with the right set of people, right? Mm -hmm. So we did that concert in China with a company called China West and Live Nation. So Live Nation is the biggest in the world. Yes. After that, we continued to do concert after concert, guerrilla marketing. We started to do work with the NBA, with Apple computers, doing all kinds of things, and then we started to manage um, live event spaces as well as we grew. Yeah, um, and it just happened, man. It I just, like the the point exactly. that you mentioned about being able to build one thing, yeah. and then let it let it spread out. That every you can build many different Love things it. around it, you know. Love because it. there are a lot of people, especially in the industry, uh, in the music industry, mm -hmm. it's more monolithic. Like it's just it can Correct. be either music and music, and so everyone trying to be music. Correct. So you have a, a whole crew that you you're making music with, and Correct. everybody want to be in the Stop. on the top spot. Okay, it's okay. We're done in a way. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it helps to think in in terms of okay, you can expand and you know definitely you know con concentrate on different definitely. things. Here you are. You're definitely. doing. You're into blockchain. Blockchain. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm into tech um, now, yeah. and 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 that change came in 2012 um, when we sold another company, but it was a dot com company, mm -hmm. right? So 2011, we started a ticketing company, online ticketing company. Mm -hmm. Again, same problem. There was no English media ticketing platform in Beijing. Right. So we said, these people can't read Chinese. They mm -hmm. need to get our tickets. We tired of driving around, selling people tickets, no, telling let's them, make our own. let's make our own. Yeah. And then it was sold a year later to a big Chinese ticketing company, right? Yes. But after that foray into the tech world, the dot com world, I was like, yeah, I, I love this. I want to get into this deeper you know, coding, doing your thing. But I had a business partner at the time who told me we should be mining Bitcoin. So we when we bought video cards mm. out in Shenzhen. We set up rigs. We did our thing. We mined. And, and then I realized that what was this built on? It was built on a distributed ledger. 
And so I said, wow, I would love to get more into that and see how that applied to certain businesses. Mm. It could be revolutionary. And, and I kind of made the breakout in 2015, 2016. And then I went gung ho with, with, with the Bahamas and trying to plan out everything we're doing now. And then even with PO8, yeah. if you look at how we've mapped up PO8, one area is the non-fungible tokens and artifacts, sea exploration. Another area is, is IP with underwater virtual reality scenes and mm -hmm. films. Another area is to seafloor mining. Another area is for the, the actual museum, right? Yes. Which hopefully by 2021, 22, we'll have a million stopover passengers. Alone at the, uh, at the museum, we'll have $80 million annually coming in. Yeah. So that's how I spread out that. But it's the same thing. Yeah. There are all of these different um, tentacles that are feeding into to, 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 to the mothership. Yes. Right? But it's, it, it, and it helps stabilize everything. But it gives also so many other opportunities. opportunities. Absolutely. Because you, you, you're going to end up meeting an AI guy who yes. is going to build on top Correct. of that using his Correct. own thing. And Correct. then just Correct. escalate from there. And so this is what we're hoping to do here in Cape Town as well. Awesome. This is amazing. <laughs> then great. Great. Hello once again and that was the end of our conversation and just before you go just want to communicate a few things with you uh, quickly if you have uh, enjoyed any of the podcasts or this specific podcast episode I would appreciate it if you share it with your friends and family through your social media Twitter Facebook etc etc as well as write me a five-star review on iTunes or Apple podcast app that would be fantastic it helps me flourish and sustain this podcast as well uh, we also on other platforms like soundcloud uh, stitcher radio um, and all other major podcast platforms so whichever way you're listening to it i would appreciate it if you leave me a review you can also subscribe to the graph podcast through my website greyjabesi.com g-r-e-y-j-a-b-e-s-i.com there you also find some of the blogs that i'm writing sometimes and you get notified as soon as the new episode has been published until next time enjoy and be productive thank you <laughs>